So it's gone live. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to Chattering with Nicholas Vince. And uh, before I introduce Simon Barnett, who's going to be uh, talking to me about Hellraiser audio plays and a whole load of other stuff uh, from Baffle Gap Productions, uh, I just wanted to thank everybody who subscribed this week. We've had half a dozen new, more subscribers this week, which is excellent. Thank you so much for that. And to everybody who's liked the Chattering with Nicholas events Facebook page, uh, I really do appreciate that as well. Um, so thank you very much indeed for doing that. Uh, before I to go any further, I just want to remind people that you can still contribute to Z Goat first, <laughs> first, first bleat. I just find that title so funny. Um, my guests, um, uh, Julianne and Bertrand, uh, last week that is still going. In fact, they just published a YouTube uh, video um, on uh, something which related to the uh, what we were talking about last week. And also, if you haven't done so, look out for Automata on uh, Kickstarter from Hex studios uh, or hex media basically laurie brewster and uh, sarah daly who i hope to be speaking to in june uh, about the campaign uh, but that's on kickstarter live and i think it finishes in like a, a couple of weeks two three weeks they've got an ambitious target of eighty thousand pounds to raise and last time i looked they were over halfway um but yeah so check out uh, automata on uh, kickstarter um, cool. And having done all those shout outs, I'm just going to introduce Simon. Hi, Simon. Hello. Hello, Nick. How are you? I'm very well. I caught the sun a bit, but apart from that. Same here. Yeah, I just got back from the beach. So oh. it's hot as hell in here. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I've just asked Craig to set up a fan. I'm just so grateful that I did. Um, cool. Well, before, I think first off, we'd just like to. Uh, talk about Grandma Guignol, because that is a podcast you've been running for what, eight weeks or six weeks? Yeah, eight weeks. Yeah. But I mean, prior to that, we actually released it as a uh, on CD and download on no on download, actually, a few years ago. Uh, right. And it was called the it's written by an author called Paul Mars, um, who he's written a series of books called the Brenda and Effie Mysteries. And it's it's a sort of prequel series written directly for audio. Um, of those of, of those characters and it's uh, Brenda who's the bride of Frankenstein and how she moves to Whitby uh, in the in the present day and opens a bread and breakfast and makes friends with Effie who's a white witch who lives next door and runs the antique shop next door and the adventures they have so um, that's basically what it is and, and anyway so we put it out a few years ago um, and then it was just sort of sitting there and somebody suggested that we put it out as a podcast just to some more people would hear it, basically. And that's that's what we did a few weeks ago. It's brilliant. I have to say, and for anybody who is Googling this or trying to find, and I will put, uh, there should be a link to Baffle Gaps. You can uh, look for it. It's called Grandma Guignol. Uh, Paul Mars, confusingly, is spelled M-A-G-R-S. Yeah, it's Irish. Yeah. Oh, uh, it's Irish. I was wondering yeah. where <laughs> I thought it was first time I met him. I thought it was a sort of affectation. I thought he just—he was a sci-fi author. I thought he'd spelt, you know, the planet Mars in an interesting way. Turns out, it's it's real, you know. It's, it's, it's real, uh, yes, because his blog is called Life on Mars, yeah, um, yeah. as well. But it's—I hadn't realised it was a prequel to these, because it—it's it, just fun. It's just tremendous fun. So, how did that come about? How did you meet Paul? How did you get involved? I um, met him in working with Paul. I met him in Whitby, funnily enough. At a, um, it was a book signing in Whitby, and uh, and he'd I'd done a series before called The Scarifiers, which had been on BBC Radio Four Extra, and he'd heard the first one of those, I think, and just emailed me, and said he really liked it, and so we'd sort of kept in vague contact. And then the first time I met him was in uh, I happened to be in Whitby on holiday, and he was doing a book signing, so I popped in there with my wife, and uh, and we saw him, and then went out for fish and chips afterwards. And then we went off to, he took us out to the Christmas Hotel, which is actually a, lo a location that's in the book and turns out to be a real hotel where it's always Christmas. Every day of the year, you walk in, there's a big Christmas tree. This was some time, no, this was Halloween, but even at Halloween, it was there was a Christmas tree as you walk in. So um, so we met there and and um, and then we did, a, we did something after that called Vince Cosmos, which was a CD with uh, Julian Ryan Tutt as uh, as a sort of David Bowie, basically, a sort of glam rock star in the 70s. 
And then we did these. We did Brenda and Effie, which turned into Grandma Guignol. Oh, wow. That's, that's right. I just and, and total coincidence that it happened to be Whitby where yeah. Brenda and yes. Effie is, is set. Yes. Uh, the tremendous, I, I, I was just saying before we came on the show, I've listened to the first six episodes of them. And what I really like about Paul's writing, um, and we'll be coming back to Paul later on because when we talk about Baker's End, uh, it's just his use of language apart from anything else. Uh, it's tremendous. And who does, and who play, so who have you got in the cast for Grand well, Guignol? So, so it's all, it's so basically it's a one person. Uh, it's almost it's narrated by one person who's, who plays Brenda and she plays Effie and plays some of the other parts and then we get a couple of other male sort of bit parts in there. But it's uh, Anne Reed from um, uh, Last Tango in Halifax and she's amazing. I mean, she's uh, I knew she could do the accent because of Last Tango in Halifax, so she can do a Yorkshire accent and she's sort of from those parts anyway, although she's a lot posher than that. And um, yeah, I mean, it was a. <laughs> It was amazing, just amazing watching her deliver those lines because she brought so much more to them than, you know, it's on the page, even though the writing, as you say, is, is, is top notch. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, re they're just wonderful. It's quintessentially English as far as I'm concerned and quint quintessentially Yorkshire. I have family from that part of the world. And, uh, and I found myself wandering around with a slightly Northern accent after listening to it. Um, <laughs> but it's, and it's that it's that sort of down to earth Yorkshireness, uh, where she meets, you know, uh, in the I mean, there's the Elephant Man and uh, a mummies and a, a, a talking cat, and uh, you know, she meets all these fantastical creatures. But she's she's very down to earth about it because she's from Yorkshire. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's what I you know that's particularly why. And as I say, it's, it's Anne Reed doing it, and and there's it's kind of gradually revealed what you know her history and uh, and so on I, she's, I love the fact she talks about putting on slathering on makeup to cover all the scars and uh, yeah so it's, well the, sort of part of that we we didn't want to give away give game away too early so you gradually find out during the stories who she is I mean if I've blown it for everyone now <laughs> <laughs> I, there's a kind of implicit spoiler alert whenever we do these shows yeah I should I always, I wish I always say immediately after somebody's given something away I have to I, <laughs> I need to add this to the top of my agenda it's like spoiler alert at the beginning of this but even knowing that I think it kind of like yeah it, even if you know that like, I think it's kind of fairly obvious what's going on in about halfway through uh, the yeah. first episode. <laughs> I should say that Paul is uh, is an amazing writer, and if you like the podcast, do track down the books, um, or go off and buy Baker's End, which is the series which we're going to come to later. Which <laughs> Baker playing himself, which is another, which is which is Paul indulging himself even more in his love of language. We even make up a language in this one, so it, that's yeah. <laughs> it's inter Yes, we w we will come back to that one later on, but um, so you produce and direct these um what's how did you get into audio production to begin with when did you first start out and what made it um well i mean to go way 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 back um i mean tw 20 years ago this is because i'm fairly old um I, I used to work at radio one so I, I was a music producer at radio one um and i produced uh, steve lamack um who's now on six music and annie nightingale and uh, various uh, people like that so um but then i moved into documentaries at radio one and in these documentaries sort of bits of elements of drama kept uh kept coming into it so um i i got um there was one i had presented by roland rat uh talking to a judge the whole like the 1980s was on trial and it was roland rat defending the 80s and talking to a judge who was played by a pretty well-known actor actually i'm um, can't remember his name escapes me but yeah it was probably the the, uh, the yeah the, the low point of his entire career was this this thing we did. But, uh, <laughs> well, sorry, just before you go any further, I should yeah. just explain because a lot of the viewers are going to be in America. Roland yeah, Rat, oh, yes, <laughs> it was was Roland Rat was a was basically he saved breakfast television for the end. He saved one of the breakfast television programs in this country hmm. uh, because they weren't doing very well. This was in the early days of breakfast television. And it was ITV's um, breakfast, I think, off the top yeah, of my head. Yeah, 
yeah, yeah. And then ratings were going around. And then suddenly they, somebody introduced this glove puppet who spoke uh, called Rowan Rat, who had a very Cockney accent and was very, really rather kind of irrelevant. Can you do an act? Can you do an do No. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Preparation. In the same way again. Yeah. <laughs> I can picture him so well, but I can't recall the, the voice went, well enough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was his was picture. That, yeah. That could be popular in the early 80s. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, the idea of Ro, Roland Rat putting the 1980s on trial or did yeah, he, he represent? Was, he, was, he was representing the 80s. Yeah. And there was a judge, and the judge was played by someone who'd just come off playing the lead in a Peter Greenaway film. So you. <laughs> <laughs> and then he found himself acting opposite Roland Rat, and the guy who played Roland Rat um, came in, and it was just this sort of um, anonymous-looking bloke in glasses came in, quite quite short, with a little case. And even though it was radio, he insisted um, taking out Roland Rat and doing doing the voice with with Roland Rat to a microphone, even though there was clearly no point in this at all because no one could see him. So. Um, but though I have to say, as an actor, I can kind of understand that because okay. if you, particularly if you're doing ventriloquism, or yeah, you're, you're doing doll, or you're doing puppet work, that becomes the character. You're, I'm not the character. I don't exist. That is the character. I, and I it, guess. Yeah, and I think. Yeah. You know, if that, <laughs> yeah. Trust you me. Seen that in the Anthony Hopkins film, Magic. Yes. Yeah, just I just thought they sort of creeped me out a bit. It was a bit like that. Yeah, but uh, of course, you know, he's Roland Rat really alive. He's he he's the one in control. <laughs> Which, funnily enough, is touched on in one of the um, Grand Marguignol episodes. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, anyways, that, but that's slightly off the point. So, that's, sure, so, sure. so, so, um, so bits of drama kept creeping into documentaries, and then I just thought, um, why don't I just go and make a drama? So, I I basically wrote one. I wrote the first of these uh, dramas called the Scarifiers, uh, which are sort of nineteen thirties sets. Um, almost like yeah, sort of comedy, supernatural mysteries. Um, and there's a top secret government department called MI13, and they um, investigate all the, the sort of weird and uncanny. And so I wrote the first one of those myself. Then I hired the studio. Um, I hired some actors to be in it. Um, and I just paid for it all myself, and it cost a couple of thousand pounds. And then I just went off and did it. And that's how I got into drama. And then that, that was bought by uh, Radio 4 Extra, by the BBC. Um, <coughs> And then, um, and then I just carried on making other stuff. And then, I mean, now I've made sort of ten, ten uh, scary fire stories, and um, yeah, and that was followed by all the other stuff we're going to talk about, I suppose. You know, right. So, and for those who haven't, I've listened to the scary fires on, on Radio Four Extra, and you mentioned you you cast some actors, some fairly well known yeah. actors. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so I mean, the the so the cast were. I deliberately picked a couple of guys who were in Doctor Who. So there was um, Nicholas Courtney, sadly no longer with us, who played the Brigadier in uh, John Pertwee's Doctor Who. Right. Um, and um, and then Terry Malloy, who played the leader of the Daleks, who was Davros. Um, Nicholas sadly died after the fifth story, I think. And then we we got in David Warner to do it. And David Warner, horror fans would know from The Omen, where he got his head cut off. Uh, Company of Wolves... Tron, um, Time Bandits, you know. So he's he, he's an amazing, he's a brilliant actor. Um, and we're an opposite, uh, playing opposite um, them. We've got uh, we've had Brian Blessed, who um, is popular in Britain. I'm not sure how he was in Flash Gordon for anyone. Yeah, I was going to say everyone who he, he he played, and it, well, anybody who's ever listened to the Flash Gordons Alive yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. is his famous line, and that's a really really bad impression of yeah. Brian. That, yeah. That's <laughs> Yeah, um, and um, yeah, and uh, other. I'm trying to remember who else we've had, um, and probably people are more famous in this country than America, like Nigel Havers. And um, uh, have you ever interviewed um, Matt Holness? No, or Garth Marenghi. Um, anyway, so 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 we've had uh, so maybe we've had various guest actors, and um, but yeah, so that's that's sort of what started me off. And, um, yeah. Right. I, I, we've just had an audience question come in. Yeah. And 
and, and I suspect the audience is Craig sitting downstairs. He's going to correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> and he asked, was Nicholas Courtney as wickedly funny as everyone says he was? Yes. Yeah, he, uh, he liked to drink um, and, um, and liked to smoke. And just, yeah, he just sort of sat there telling stories. And, you know, he, he was lovely, you know. Um, yeah, um, it's unfortunate that, you know, our, our, the first three stories we did, he was fine, first three or four. But then he, you, there was clearly, he just wasn't as well as he had been. Mm. You know? but, um, but, yeah, he liked nothing better to, than to um, get down the pub and hold court and, I mean, this was when you could smoke in pubs. This is how long ago it was. And he'd just sit there puffing away and, um, you know, and telling you all his odd stories. He was lovely. Yeah, I, he, he was a neighbour of uh, a friend of mine, uh, a guy okay. called John, John Bolton, who is an artist, a uh, friend of mine. He used to live up in North London, uh, yeah. a few doors yeah. down from Nicholas Courtney. I never got to meet him. Uh, but he always sounded very uh, good. Um, Kim, I'm going to come to your question. We have another question coming from Kim. Yeah. Um, okay, so there are people watching this, are there? Yeah, there, yeah really, honestly, there are. Um, okay. Is uh, there anyone wondering why I keep looking in the wrong direction? I should explain that my webcam on this new laptop is right in the corner of in the bottom corner. So um, so I keep, anyway, that's, that's why I keep looking the wrong way. It's okay. I, I look the wrong way every so often as well. Um, Yes, well, we actually we can. I'll come back to your question in a couple of minutes, Kim. I won't forget. I promise you. Um, so, for those of you who don't, for those of us who don't know, um, of the people who don't know, what is the process of creating an audio play? So you, you, you decided to do your drama. You, you yeah. Um, you mentioned documentaries that you did as well, but decided to. Do, you mentioned getting a studio. What is the process of creating an audio play? Well, um, okay, say say with the Hellbound Heart, which we're going to talk about mm. later. Um, so first of all, I'd, I I looked into getting the rights to do it. Um, so that happened. Then I got a then I got a writer. So this is this is from production, but from my mm. point of view. Um, then I uh, got Paul Kane to write it, and then I script edited what he sent me, and we went through various drafts, getting it right. Um, <clears throat> Then it's booking a studio, um, employing the actors, and you, I mean, and you sort of agonise over the actors, over exactly which ones. It's not, um, you know, because I, I direct them at all, I, I direct them as well, and that's. But the directing actors is not difficult if you just get the right actors. I've had experiences before when you get the wrong actors, <laughs> and it's and it takes all day, and it's a nightmare, and you you know, and you sort of, and yeah, so just get the so I. I'm recording something this week and I have on next Thursday and I'm and I just have the best cast for it. I'm so excited. I can't even tell you who those who that cast is, but um um yeah, anyway. So so it's so, so, yeah, so casting and then you have to uh plan plan how the day is going to go, which is um you know in which audio you're going to record, who which actors you need for which scene. So basically do your do your prep. Then go in the studio um uh, record you can record about <coughs> about an hour's worth in one day um so uh, you re you record it uh, make sure everyone's happy um you know make sure they're fed and watered and uh, all the rest of it then uh then it's the question of doing the sound design um and so you get sound design to do that and a um and a composer to do the music and you work very then they will send you various drafts and you listen to that again and um, so that takes a long time with the composer you may have a certain type of music in mind so you'll send them lots of examples and just and so it's a yeah and then eventually you get down to the marketing bit you know and then just putting it out there and getting and getting it reviewed and marketing it and um so it's a long long involved process and God, I don't know why I do it, really. <laughs> There's a Thinking couple of questions. <laughs> yeah, why do you? Do? Yeah, I think whenever I talk to people, they all feel that at some point. <laughs> it's like, why do you do these crazy I mean, things? The, the, the good thing about it is, um, is if you're a if if you've got something of the control freak about you, then you are in control of everything. Right. You, I mean, all those all those people are involved. And if you look at the credit lists on on, a, on one of our productions, there's quite a long list of people. But I employed every one of those people, and I worked very closely with all of those people. And it's like um, it's like sort of, 
you know, it's the closest you'll get to being a film director who who has a very tight control over his production, um, and probably more, you know, probably have more control than you would in that in those circumstances because with films you have far more far more people working for you. So, um, so yeah, so 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 that's the great thing. It is basically your vision that you see through from beginning to end. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. You mentioned sound design, and you mm. need to put the sound. What what does that actually involve? I, I kind of have a vision of sliders and tracks, but what what does that mean? Um, well, first of all, you'll sort out the dialogue. Um, I mean, it's all it's all done on um, on various uh, audio editing systems. You'll have you'll have sort of tracks. Which are, I'm doing this too to no one. But, <laughs> but you have uh, all these tracks on a screen. And on the first track, <coughs> you'll probably have the dialogue. And you know, um, the first few tracks, and, and that's sort of, I don't know, maybe you'll have like four actors talking, so four tracks of dialogue. Then underneath that, there will be, then you'll sort of treat those voices to make them sound like where they are. So they could be in a room or they could be out in a field and that, that will be completely different. Um, they, if, you're, if you're out in a field, your voice will sound very thinned out, if that makes sense. And if you're in a room, it could be quite sort of reverby and echoey, depending on the size of the room. So you've got all of that. Um, then on top of that, you've got all the, so you just, I mean, you can just keep adding all these tracks. You can just go on forever, essentially, and just keep on adding, you know, um, footsteps and the wind, uh, going through trees and, uh, you know, and just, yeah. And that, that's basically what sound design is. And you build it up and build it up and build it up. And then you end up with something, um, <coughs> that's, that's quite sort of realistic sounding. Having said that, I mean, Sometimes you don't have to make it realistic. Sometimes a suggestion is of something is enough, and sometimes you can make it too realistic, and it detracts from what you're trying to say. So you might want to highlight the fact that um, you know that we're if you're trying to highlight something that's sort of psychologically important um, to a character, then you don't want the sounds of someone going past on their motorbike or something. You want to draw in on their. I'm not explaining this very well. No, no, you are. No, no, that makes this is making sense to me. Yeah, you see, well, so you, so I mean, you can almost you could you could sort of start off with sound effects, and the sound effects could gradually dissipate, and we're just with the almost like the inner thoughts of this character. So you can do things like that with audio. Um, it's, it's fascinating. It, yes, it, it's not. It's not. It doesn't have to be completely realistic, is what I'm saying. Yeah, so basically you, you can establish a sense of place, as you say, with the audio and the people chatting in a cafe, for example. Yeah. You, know, you, you hear them enter and you hear the, the sound of the door and you hear all the chat yeah. in the background. By the, and, and then when they sit at the table and you're going to fade out the background yeah, so you can exactly. hear the and that, and that is sort of what you do naturally anyway. I mean, if you, if you go into a, a cafe with a microphone and record the noise there, then you come back and listen to it, you think, oh, that's incredibly noisy. I didn't know it was that noisy. And it's because we just filter all that out so we can talk to each other. You know, you just sort of don't, you, you just sort of ignore the noise. But that's sort of what you're trying to replicate, I guess. The human experience more than the what's actually happening. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> thank you. That's absolutely fascinating. Okay, so you, 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 you as you're saying, you, you, you do all that and you, you, you do all that, you, you, um, and you just say, hey, you have a lot more control, even for an independent filmmaker who does his own editing or does his own VFX and and so on. You've got you you've got all that. I have to say, and we can now we'll start talking about the Hellbound Heart um, and my experience. Firstly, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. Very <laughs> pleased you said yes. You know, <laughs> like a sort of like a seal of approval. Even <laughs> from, from the old guard. Yeah, from the old guard. Yes, yes. <laughs> just looking, funny enough, I was just looking at a photograph that was taken on the first, the, the, the set of Hellraiser of Clive with the four Cenobites. Um, I managed to track down because uh, somebody was asking me for it. He said they, and I knew it had appeared in, in, in Time Out years ago. Anyway, but actually just looking at that. Uh, photograph is bringing it back all those experiences again so what i found fascinating is the studio i think we were in moat studios yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was it was a great experience a lovely place to record 
I hadn't realized we were all going to be in our own little booth. That's that's unusual. There's not many like that. Um, most most studios are as you would you you know you'd expect from just from seeing radio studios and TV, or, mm. um, which had people gathered around the microphone and actors with their scripts all sort of got bunched around and then they sort of lean in and do their do their bit. Whereas Moat is, as you say, it's like um, seven phone boxes, essentially. Um, and they're all separate from each other. But, I mean, I find that you just get more done. And um, and so... It I, was in... Yeah, it was in... I have to say, again, from the actor's point of view, it was just kind of like, oh, okay, well, the microphone the script's there, but the actor I'm playing with is, is over there. Yeah. It took me a little while just to kind of get my head around. It's like, actually, yeah, I can, you, I can do it. Was it? It was interesting. I mean, because she was, um, and because my head is just, uh, who, who was the actress playing Julia? Oh, uh, what? Um, Neve McIntosh. Yes, Neve. Neve yeah. McIntosh. Love with Neve. Um, it was great. It, it was really good fun. Then. Yeah. So get, yes. <laughs> Me playing a sleazy businessman. That was fun. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I remember saying to you, just make it sleazier. <laughs> It's like, oh, you want this? Yeah, it's, it was fun trying to seduce Neve in another booth. <laughs> yeah, well, they got all kinds of things in those booths. I mean, was, I think there are three sex scenes in Hellburn Heart. I was listening to, I was like, you very kindly sent me the link to that. And I was listening, I was thinking, it's very naughty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it yeah it, it's incredibly effective. It was I was I would say I mean that was that was probably the best the, the most fun I've ever had recording that day, and it was really? I couldn't quite believe how just how much you're getting away with you know in one day I think we had three sex scenes we had four murders plus you know never mentioned the you know the demons from hell and all the rest of it the, the you know the torture scenes and everything. <laughs> And you're just going, doing all of this in like seven or eight hours. It was great. I mean. <laughs> well, I, what I particularly remember was having done my death scene, um, walking out to the rest of because it was just Neve and I in the, in the booth, and then the mm. green room was just uh, walking out, and the, the other actors like just looking at me saying, "Wow, you really screamed." <laughs> <laughs> that was really that sounded really convincing okay <laughs> and i was so glad that my screams got to the trailer <laughs> yeah yeah you want to get the trailer. yeah yeah that was good but it, because <laughs> i happen to be listening to this on the train going to see a mate of mine so bright sunny day sitting in this almost empty compartment though there was somebody sitting there i kind of listening saying oh that's me oh that's oh, this this sounds really cool and then I'm just being killed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you don't want you don't want your headphones to be bleeding out. So no. other, other commuters can hear what you're listening to because there's just lots of panting and screaming, and it's just you know, and I it's just not safe for work or commuting or no, being, no, not at all. Place. Yeah. And it, 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 it's great. And it's one of the things I've always loved about the original Hellraiser is the three guys who Julia brings back to the house. Um, I think those things are incredibly effective. Uh, they really, really do work very well. So yeah, it, it was tremendous fun to do. And it, the, the result is, is extraordinary. Um, it's brilliant, absolutely uh, brilliant. And that leads me on to Kim's question. Kim, um, any chance, uh, Kim, sorry, Simon from Kim. Yes. Any chance you will be doing more audio work from other Clive Barker, no Barker novels? I would love it if you would do The Thief of Always. Okay. I've actually, I've never read The Thief of Always. Um, I do, is, it, is it long? I don't... Is it, what it's is a proper novel. It's, it's a year. I mean, I read it when it first came out. Um, mm. And it's on the shelf somewhere, but it's a proper... I've got a hard... I'm sure I've got a hard bag. Length... It's shorter than Weave World. It's yeah. not quite as short as, it's not quite as long as, we, it's not a novella like Hellbound yeah. Heart is, which I'm guessing it made it kind of easier to do. That's, yeah, so that that's a th that's why, well, there's two reasons why we did Hell, Hellbound Heart. Um, first of all, it's short, as you said. And second of all, it's Hellraiser, which is the thing that Clive is um, most well known for. Um, but yeah, I'd love to do more. 
Clive Barker. I mean, I'd love to do the Damnation game, or I mean, I'm sure I'd love to do Thief Always. I just need to read it. Um, a Weave World would be amazing, but I mean, Weave World, you're talking about a you know a Radio Four series or something. I mean, it would cost yeah. cost a lot and take a long time to tell that story. So um, I would absolutely love to do more, but it just depends on how this one does. Um, so we need everyone who's uh, watching to buy at least 10 copies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't mind. Yes. Yeah. Buy, them, yeah. buy them now. Give them to your friends at Christmas. They'll be exactly. wonderful gifts. Yeah. yeah, they'll, you yeah. Know, and there must or be the, birthdays during the year. Years. If you only know one person who likes Clive Barker, then it's 10 years worth. Well, but also, you know, just introduce people to Clive Barker. It's He's a damn true. good writer. You know, anybody who likes horror or fantasy, um, yeah, I, I'm sure yeah. that would, yeah, okay. yeah. That's so, so yeah, but the answer is yes, I'd love to do more. And in fact, I mean, if uh, if we manage to get um, more a partner to do this with, like a commercial partner to do with this with, then possibly we'll be doing more Clive Barker. But um, yeah, we'll see. Watch this space, I would say. <laughs> yes, like That's all these things. More. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I, I think that's how oh, well, I just such a wonderful experience. Um, I do, it is it is good, folks. Not just for me. I don't just say this is me listening to myself seducing people and getting killed, um, but also well, playing. Uh, actually, since it's, since it's um, all the other people from Hellraiser have sort of got in touch via Facebook or just wanted to be my friends on Facebook, so I think they all want to be part of the next one. Is there <laughs> even the guy who plays? Uh, Pinhead in a new film, most recent, the new Pinhead. Even he's got in touch. Oh wow! I think everyone, in fact, apart from Doug, but uh, but they, everyone apart from yeah, they, they've all sort of, they're all my friends now. Oh, that's... <laughs> 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 well, I know Doug's based, and I and I'm a bit, uh, I think the gentleman's name is Paul, off the top of my head, who's the new, who I'm getting to meet in a couple of weeks because he's okay. a Texas fright there as well. Um, so they may not realize you're based in London. Uh, but yeah, but they're, they're good actors. Yeah, you should use them. Well, um, yeah, although that doesn't mean, I mean, I know that um, for the, uh, when Audible did the X-Files recently, they um, they recorded David Duchovny's, all of his lines were recorded in separately from everyone else, um, just by himself in LA somewhere. Yes. So, you know, that, that is the beauty of audio, you know. Well, there's not even that's the beauty of film i've just done voiceovers and done acting to camera for stuff that's happening in ireland this last week green screen and oh of course yeah 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 for trailers so yeah okay. it's <laughs> it, it's an interesting way of making films um but if, yeah it's, it's 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 all possible okay yeah. well that's hellraiser um what are one of the other things I've been listening to in the last few days is Blood on Satan's Claw. How did that yes. one come about? How did that one come about? Um, well, I wanted to do The Wicker Man. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't get the rights, so I did Blood on Satan's Claw instead. Um, no, I mean, uh, that is sort of true, actually. The um, no, I, I put a few feelers out for things that I wanted to do, and um, some of them still might happen. But Blood on Satan's Claw was, I, f I found out who did the rights, who, who had the rights, and it's quite easy to get the rights. And I've always been a big fan of the film. Um, but the, in the, the thing about it, what made it worth doing for me is that the film is not perfect. I mean, it's um, <coughs> it's got this amazing atmosphere, and it's quite, um, it was sort of completely unlike the, uh, the the other films like Hammer films and things like that were around in the early seventies, the same sort of time. I think it was seventy one. So Hammer was um, sort of on its last legs by then. Um, and um, yeah, so so it was, and it, it was very sort of brutal and um, and very had this very weird, strange atmosphere about it, which I think is why it survived. But it's it's full of it's got full of uh, plot holes. It's full of plot problems, basically. Mm -hmm um because it was three uh three short films <coughs> uh portmanteau sort of um film uh and then they stitched it together at the last minute and it doesn't quite hang together it doesn't hang together at all actually i mean i i wrote a i, w I watched it i wrote a list of all the things that didn't make any sense 
for um for Mark who adapted it, Mark Morris. And uh, it was a lengthy list. I mean, very yeah. I mean, it's so there was so basically it, there was room for improvement. And in fact, that, the same with Hellraiser. It's not that Hellraiser there was room for improvement, but with Hellraiser, I thought it was worth doing because we'd never had a female um, lead um, Cenobite before, mm-hmm. and also because it, it has that the, the film has that strange transatlantic thing going on where they it was filmed here, but some of the cast are in American or dubbed into American, and, and it's so it's a bit. So it was going back to the original. It was doing there was a reason to do it. You know, you wouldn't just be doing exactly the same thing. So with Blood on Satan's Claw, um, that that was the reason I thought we could do it. And then um, uh, then I got in touch with um, Mark Gatiss, um, and he I knew that he was a fan of the film. So um, and then he said he'd love to do it. And then Rhys Shearsmith, and once Mark and Rhys were on board, then suddenly everyone else was was keen to do it. So we got an extraordinary cast with uh, Alice Lowe and Thomas Turgus. <coughs> Uh, John Heffernan, um, um, what's his face? Uh, <laughs> the, bloke, the bloke from The Witch, uh, he played the lead character in The Witch, Ralph Innocen, uh, yeah, he was very good. And he was in a tiny, tiny role, but he, he, he only, you know, it took him like half an hour to recall, but um, he just wanted to, well, he knew Rees, but he wanted to come and work with Mark and, you know. Um, so, so yeah, so it all sort of spiralled out of that, really, and it was... Um, uh yeah a joy a joy to do i hadn't realized it was that does kind of when you because i watched the film first and mm. then i listened to the audio um which i was doing this afternoon and it it's far more effective than the film it's it's longer as well it's what yeah two, two hours 30 yes yeah, it's, it's about two and a half hours yeah yeah and um, um, you sort of need well in fact mark's original um draft was three and a half hours so um, <laughs> uh, I told him to lose an hour. <laughs> uh, it was much better for it; it was much tighter. But uh, it did. Uh, it does explore the the characters' backstories a lot more. But it also just it needs more space to to make sense. I mean, yeah, the original, as I said, the original film doesn't make much sense. No, I it, it, now I know that it's three stories, but short films kind of mishmashed. Together, yeah. that kind of because this when you're watching the film, you really do feel it's something like, hold on, who are these characters who's just suddenly, yeah, and the uh, characters, uh, character, you see, are really, so the characters from the first bit, they just vanish. And it's like, what happened? <laughs> what happened to them? <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then Simon Williams turns out with one hand, just somewhere near the end. So you just like, you know, the, the guy, yeah. yes, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like, what happened to? What's happened to him? Well, also, okay. one character decides that the best thing for him to do is to go to London. That's and right. And then they yeah. bring him back to do the kind of the witch trialy bit. Yeah. Like... Yeah, he's just like, I'm off to have a think about it. And then I'm yeah. going to come back with an enormous sword and sort everything out in the last in the last act. So, yeah, we go, we sort of tried to sort that out a bit. Um, oh. You know, but, you know, I, I don't want to sound like I'm slagging off the original film because I do love the original film. It's just uh, you can tell it's three films. That's all. Yeah, yeah. No, I had no, I hadn't realised that at all. And I, I did <coughs> noted on Wikipedia that they decided that um, because they were originally after Christopher Lee or Peter Cushing to play the yeah. lead, and then just decided they were too expensive. Um, but it's great. Patrick you Patrick Weimar. Yeah, yeah. And you ha- you do have the great and the good. You know, all the British character actors from those. It's actually a Tigon production, I think, rather That's than right, yeah. Hammer. Um, I always remember watching Tigon films and being fascinated by the uh, the idea of the, the creature that was half lion, sorry, half tiger, male tiger, female lion. If it's a Tigon, otherwise it's yes. a liger. Um, <laughs> your yeah, useless yeah. piece of information for the day. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but yeah, so <laughs> it's a very effective, and again, very chilling. I think what I, what again, what I like about the film, and, and particularly about the audio players, it's the children. It's the fact. Yeah, I mean, children are bastards anyway. They're yeah, little... I mean, it, it was it was based upon a um, I can't remember a name now, but it was based around or, or the inspiration came from a real life murder case back in back in the late sixties. Oh wow! Uh, is it uh, Mary Bell? I think. Um, anyway, but it was a bit like the Jamie Bolger case. This will mean nothing to American viewers, but 
but basically there was um there were some children and they ended up sort of um i I don't know, I can't remember the details. Uh, either they, they, either she killed some younger, I must be very careful what I say, really. But there were some child murders, some murders involving children, and it sort of stemmed out of that, I think, the original. Ah. Uh, uh, but I, I, and again, what I really like about your version of it is it's, it's that thing of Russian, you know, the age of reason, the age of enlightenment, and the fact, you know, that this is, this is, this is all superstition, or is it not superstition? And 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 the dynamism between the the characters and playoff. Yeah. Well, we also wanted to make them because um, we we relocated it to the north, the north of England, because it was more it seemed more sort of gritty and brutal, I suppose. Whereas the the original is sort of those sort of mama set accents a bit, which I don't th we didn't think would work on audio quite so well because they, there's a it can be slightly funny sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, for an Amer American audience, uh, watches Mama yeah. Set is kind of a term for Mama yeah. Set. It, it's it's a non-existent <laughs> place where it's your general country accent where every idiot yeah. talks like that. Well, Gabriel, yeah. the That's archers. Right. Yeah, so we were located it's the north. But the the other reason was that I I had in mind that the, that the the kids I just wanted them to just be mouthy teenagers, just like sort of horrible mouthy teenagers that we'd have today. So there's no you know just, but. And that was sort of easier to come accomplish in some way with northern accents. And funnily make, enough, it's where a lot of the witch trials actually took place. Well, that was it. And there was also we slightly tied it in with um, like the Pendle witch trials, which we, there was there's there's a hint in there that um, that something happened like fifty years before, which would tie in. So it's about the right sort of thing for the Pendle witch trials. Ah, ah, it's good. Anyway. It, it, it's fun. It's it, it's really really effective play. Um, you mentioned earlier on. Baker's End. Yes. With Tom Baker and then Colin Baker. Mm -hmm. So tell us, so how did Baker's End come up? And what, well, what is Baker's End? Good for, uh, right. <laughs> well, Baker's <laughs> End is, um, I'll tell you how it came about, in fact. I mean, so uh, I was, so Paul, Paul Mars, the, the writer of, of them all, um, he used to write um, Doctor Who audios for the BBC for BBC audio or audio go um, and he wrote tons of these um, a few years ago and then they stopped making them but he kept in touch with Tom Baker and um, and occasionally uh, he would tell me what the latest thing that Tom had said or the talk you know um, and 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 he certainly then who sent me a story he'd written at Christmas and he'd sent to Tom Baker and he sent it to a few of his friends as well. And it was about a busker um, who was out, just about a, a, I can't remember the details of it, but it was about a busker in, in Manchester. And, and the busker had like the head of a, of a, of a horse. Right. Um, and, and it, no, it was, no, the head of a dragon. Yeah, it was, and it was Clacky the dragon. Um, and he sent it to Tom Baker, and Tom Baker sent it back saying that this was fantastic and he absolutely loved it. And, um, and then I said to, and me and Paul had recently been involved in another audio project which didn't, which didn't quite come off. So I said, well, why don't we just do do something with Tom Baker um, and make it about Clacky the Dragon, which is what the first, the, who's the villain in the first, in the first uh, Baker's End. And then I said, but we've got to have Tom Baker playing Tom Baker. And so he pitched him the idea and Tom wasn't keen, but then he said, but then Paul persuaded him. And then, um, and it sort of grew from there. So the idea is Tom Baker. Who say who? Everyone, does everyone know who Tom Baker is? I, I, I think I, I'm assuming that most people know Tom Baker. The doc. Anybody who watches Doctor Who, any Who viewers yeah. watching this, will know who Tom Baker <laughs> is. But be, what, what is he? Sixth? Craig will tell me exactly what number Doctor Tom four. Baker is. Number four. Number four. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, of course he is, because he's immediately yeah. after Patrick Troughton. Now after Pertwee. Okay, I'm really bad on the early Doctors. I might have watched okay. the original program when it was broadcast. Arnold Trout and Pertwee Baker. That's <laughs> right. And I might have worn very long scarves, Tom Baker style part scarves, when I was a teenager. Um. <laughs> yeah, but so, so so he was Doctor Who, and he was he was, and many people of a certain age would say that he's still the best Doctor Who because he was the only one who was. Uh, his like. He is he is the doctor he's a, he's not sure he wasn't acting the part he's a very uh, unusual character and he was when we recorded these as well 
Um, All I can remember is Tom Baker's, Tom Baker's doctor constantly offering people jelly babies, apart from right. the scarf and that. Constantly that's offering people jelly babies, which I thought was so cool. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And the scarf, of course. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, so the idea, so the, so the premise of the series is that um, Tom Baker is uh, living in a, it's, it's the real Tom Baker. He, uh, he lived in a village somewhere in England, um, with happenstance. He's a bit bored of living. So he, so it starts off in his, with his funeral, which he liked the idea of because Tom is quite into, he, I think he, he's at, where he last used to live. He had his own gravestone. Um, he's right, ready made in the in the churchyard, ready for him to sort of jump in it at some point. <laughs> so um, <laughs> he's he's, he's he, you know he's quite he's quite sort of morbid, and um, yeah. So 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 it starts off with his funeral, and then but then it's like uh, there's then his ex TV companion from a series that's very like Doctor Who comes to the funeral, and then she suspects that he's actually not dead. And then he pops up again later on, and he and he tells and he's wearing a giant cat suit. <laughs> and then he says, "Everyone, he's been reincarnated as the King of Cats," and um, and it sort of goes from there. I mean, what it's about, you know? We just made it. <laughs> it is the use of language. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, that it, came about. You're the first person I've I've ever told this to. Um, that came about by accident. <coughs> the first um, <coughs> draft of the script was uh, full of swearing, and it was full of there were, and he was quite sweary because Tom is quite quite sweary in real life in a funny way, like Brian Blessed. He just you know, um, and Tom wasn't keen because Tom sort of wants to appeal to children. Really, that's all he's interested in, you know. So he wasn't keen on the swearing. So um, so he went away, and and Paul just made up a sort of Lewis Carroll type of um language you know just made up new words and, and some of them are real words some of them are like words from 17th century and um dandy was, pratt dandy pratt yeah. is the word that i yes i, I recognize yeah. a few yes and i recognize some of the lowest count yes, yes quite a lot of it's real but then out of that sort of sprung this invented these invented words and uh and it's full of that so um it's a it's a very very strange listen but um you know we, we were very proud of it and it won a couple of awards so um you know we that. that was brilliant and who, is it katie manning who yeah who is it? yes yeah who's who's who was john pert was the companion of the third doctor and um and yeah she's in it and she plays uh yeah she, she's in it and um who else we had uh diane morgan was in was in one of them who's uh philomena kunk on tv or, oh, right uh, yeah she's in the second story um that's on bbc tv she's got a series at the moment um, <laughs> yeah Oh, and two, oh, it's brilliant. And and you did three with Tom, and you've just yeah, done one with Colin. He, he agreed to do three, and um, and then at the end he was like, "Well, that's that." And we said, "Well, do you want any more?" And he said, "No, that's fine." You know, <laughs> enjoyed doing those three. You know, thanks very much. And um, and he never changed his mind about things. Apparently, his agent said, "Oh, don't try and change his mind. He just there's no point." You know, he just never he never does. Um, and so we went to, so we just thought, well, we don't want it to end. So, so we got Colin Baker in instead. So then we wouldn't need to change the title. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, Colin's great as well. So, you know, it's a very different um, performance. Yes. Uh, yeah. And um, I mean, he's great. And I think we'd like to do more with him, but it's just finding the, so busy at the moment. He's trying to find the time to do more. And Paul, Paul is incredibly busy. So, um, but I know Colin really enjoyed it, and we liked having him with two some more at some point. Fun, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I've only had a chance to listen to one, but it, the, the first one, um, I, yes. As, uh, I just love the use of the language. It's uh, it, it's oh, good. It's, it's, it's brilliant. It works really, really well. Um, so the, the last week I, I wanted to listen to and, and talk to you about is Hammer Chillers. Yes. Now yeah, horror thing we did, yeah. The horror thing we, you did. Now, why Hammer and how did this one come about? Well, um, I could I could just hear my little boy who's about to, who's about to go to bed. Um, yeah, he, I can hear him going, Daddy, Daddy. Anyway, I'll, I shall pretend this isn't happening. And we <laughs> Well, we've only um, got 10 minutes to go. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, how much of us? So um, I can't quite remember how it came about. It was... Um, I'd... 
it was something to do with I knew Marcus Hearn, who's the editor now, the editor of Doctor Who magazine, and he, but he was involved with Hammer, and um, and he was doing stuff with Hammer Films. Um, are you still? You've frozen a bit there. Oh yeah, he's still there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Okay. So 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 anyway, so he put us in touch with Hammer, and I wanted, to, and I was very keen to do something with Hammer, and um, so we just tried out these six stories in the, in the style of um, Hammer House of Horror, you know. So just uh, six half hour stories and um and they yeah and so we tried them out i mean i thought they were good there was one there's one story i'm not so keen on but i thought the rest of them were pretty good and there's a couple i thought were great um and um and we'd like to have done more but um i just don't think it was quite tied enough to the hammer brand or the hammer or hammer fans for them to i mean it so basically it needed to have christopher lee in it or or at the very least, you know, Caroline Monroe or you know, Madeline Smith or someone like that. Ah, uh, um, interesting. We nearly did a couple of other things with them. We nearly did, um, oh, we, well, we nearly did actual Hammer House of Horror um, with, we, and that would have had a bigger partner to sort of get it out there and um, make more of it. And we nearly did a Van Helsing series. Um, and the person we had in mind for Van Helsing actually was Guy Henry, who was um, who later played Peter Cushing uh, in the in Rogue One in the Star Wars film. So, oh, wow. so we would have had Guy Henry playing Peter Cushing before before they did for Star Wars. But you, the, there's also a, a Peter Cushing connection anyway, because you release some Peter yeah, Cushing was, recordings. I think that was the sec. That was the first thing I did after the Scarifiers. After the first couple of Scarifiers, was um, I just a big Peter Cushing fan? Um, I've got a bit. I've got a watercolor of his because he used to do painting. I've got one mm. of them in the room downstairs, and I, I he lived in where I grew up. He lived down the road, so I cycled up there one day when I was like, thirteen or fourteen, and went into the Tudor tea rooms to get his autograph. And there he was. He just happened to be. We'd go, he went there every lunchtime. Um, so um, yeah, so I'd always been a big fan, and then I I found out that he'd uh, released his. <coughs> He'd released Sherlock Holmes, a couple of Sherlock Holmes. Um, uh, no, hang on, it was. I can't remember which. It, it, it's basically lots of lots of Sherlock Holmes short stories, and he released them, uh, and they were only available to the blind, so the RNIB, and they were so no one sort of knew that they existed. These these stories, um, unless you were blind, and so I got the license to release those, and then I also got the license to do his autobiography, which he which he read himself, or the second volume, which is about Hammer. Which is uh, past forgetting, and um, yeah, but we've uh, sold out of that now, so you can't buy it. Oh, yeah. sorry. Available for download? No, nope. no, we didn't get the download rights. No, this is, uh, no, but uh, yeah, I mean, to, to be honest, it it didn't sell that well. Funny enough, there's you think you, you you sort of think that people that there are tons of Peter Cushing fans out there, or tons of Sherlock Holmes fans, or whatever, and then it then then it's you know. You, Sometimes it's disappointing, you know. It's strange, isn't it? Yeah. And you know, you know, based on the the, the popularity of recorded, I mean, Audible seems to be doing. Well, you know, there, there's there's a lot of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of material out there. Um, we have a quick question from Kim again. Thank you, Kim. Okay. Um, yeah, again. <laughs> um, that's coming, winding back to the Hellbound Heart. Mm. Did you? Ha uh, do, 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 do. Who? It, it, it's slightly truncated questions. I think what she's asking is, who did you have in mind? Did you have anyone in? Ah, oh, yeah, it's the, the the who is placed oddly in the in in the in the question. I was like, thank you very much for involving me. How did you choose? You, and you talked about the importance of casting. Mm. Was there anybody that you immediately thought of? uh for the the cast of hellbound heart not not immediately no um the i didn't have anyone in mind when it was being created i mean and then well, i worked with alice on alice low on um, blood on satan's claw and i <clears throat> i thought first so, so she was my initial thought that she would be as i read the book and as i read and as we got the script together it became clear that kirsty in the book is a very different character from the from the kirsty in the film 
and she's um, she's a bit of a stalker. She sort of <laughs> stalks poor old poor old Rory, um, and uh, just yeah, just, I mean, she's slightly obsessed with him and does some weird things, and she's quite needy. And then she sort of transforms later on. She becomes more steely, you know, uh, as um, she's required to later on. Um, and I thought, you know, so I thought actually Alice would be really good at that. She often plays quite complex characters, and um, so and and she'd been great to work with on Battle of Satan's Claw. So I thought so I offered it to her. Um, and the other one was uh, Tom Meaton, who I who I watched in The Ghoul. Um, and then when I saw him in The Ghoul, I was aware that he'd done work with uh, the Mighty Boosh and uh, who are a comedy act in the UK. Um, and um, and so I'd seen his comedy stuff, so I knew he could do light stuff. I didn't wasn't aware that he could do dramatic acting. But then I saw The Ghoul, which was a film that came out last year, which is a horror film, um, very low budget. They made it for, I mean, the low thousands. It was literally nothing. It's like five thousand pounds or something. It's crazy. I mean, and it's a it's a great looking film. Um, and um, and he and he's really got the dramatic chops. He's 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 got a really gravelly voice, and he's and he's sinister. And um, so I thought um, he could play Frank and and Rory. So that was my, that was the I wanted someone who could do both, and someone who could be a who could do a sort of light comic performance, and also uh, be really really scary. Was uh, was what I was after. Um, and uh, Neve McIntosh came along. Um, I can't remember how we got Neve, but I mean, I've always just thought she was a really interesting actress, and I and I and I wanted somebody who could. Um, Julia in the film, she's a sort of ice queen, and she's quite a fierce, you know, domineering mm. character. Um, but there's uh, the way that the way that Frank treats um, the way that Frank treats her uh, in the book. I mean, she there's she's she's not. I didn't quite understand how we got from that sort of submissive character to being this this ice queen, because she's quite. Um, she's also. She's sort of desperately in love, and she and she's doing these things out of out of a sort of misguided love, and she's so she's obviously you know she's prepared to go out and murder for him, but there's a there's a, there's a sort of need again there's a sort of neediness and a desperation there, and I thought you know Neve is a very good actress, and I thought she um, she does that very well, and she. Um, and she brought that to it, uh, um, and and the search for the female pinhead was a nightmare, and took ages, ages and ages and ages to get exactly the right voice. And even when we recorded it, I wasn't sure it was right, and it took a long time to sort of play around with effects and things till till we were happy. But it's a tricky one because I mean, even and fiddling with your voice as well. I mean, it, all all the Cenobites' voices. I mean, the stuff we got back from the studio sounded. Silly, you know, Cenobites. <laughs> you know, people. I remember he's like, can you make it more breathy? I think that's whispery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they've got it's to. Really but, challenge. They're, but they're not Doctor Who monsters. They're they're they sort of have to be real. But I mean, that so it was that, that was really tricky getting the Cenobites right. It was hard, and the casting of um, Evie. I think, in, yeah. I mean, I, I was. I as I said, I. I I would have just kept re-recording those lines until we got it right with mm. differences if it hadn't worked out. But luckily, uh, I think we did. We got. We were lucky that we. Evie was really good. Even on the day, we were trying to nail it down to exactly the right sort of intonation. And um, yeah, I, yeah. I, rem I remember, I'm really struggling and, and and really trying to avoid sounding like Gollum. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what can I say? Um, my precious is. Um, <laughs> the, the, sorry, Andy Circus. Um, right, and there was a second part to Kim's question, which will be the last question because we're at the end. Sure, sure. The, so, what What is the main challenge in writing an audio play? I think I'm going to paraphrase your question. Kim. What is the main challenge in writing an audio play you, as opposed to? Yeah. script you know stage play or a, a film script how how do you think a right well you've written obviously so you yeah. mentioned you wrote the scary fires yourself what is it you look for in an audio script 
Well, I mean, so the, the main ch challenge, so it's the, there's the obvious one, which is that you can't see anything. So there's a, if you're doing anything that's vaguely visual, then you, you have to try and avoid people going, um, he's got a gun, <laughs> <laughs> which is always, like, he's got a gun. Um, and uh, yeah, watch out. Um, oh, that just missed me, you know, which was actually, which is, um, you know, was a problem we had with uh, the Hellbound Heart. I mean, a lot of it is very visual and there's a bit where, you know, Julia gets stabbed and what do you say apart from, oh, you stabbed me with that knife, you know? <laughs> so, or how do you describe the, the, what they, what they look like, these things without, without Frank going, oh my God, you've got no skin, you know, oh my God, you've got things sticking out your head. So you have to think of clever ways around it, which is sometimes things are described retrospectively, which is what we do, um, um, with voiceovers and things like that, which we'll do with Hellbound Heart. Um, but the other thing is trying to get to the, because you've got no, <clears throat> you've got no um, author's voice in it, then it's trying to get, you're trying to convey their emotional state of mind just through, just through words. And you've got nothing mm. else. You've got no clever visuals or anything. It's just words um, and performances. So, um, so that's, that's, that's difficult as well. Mm. Um, yeah, is that an answer? Yeah, like yeah, no, it's, 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 yeah. it's a, because I mean, you know, the, the, you often hear it listening to Anna Karenina the other day, you have a narrator voice to yeah. describe, to paint that picture for you. But if you're just going to do it without narrator voice, I, I imagine, yes, it makes it, it real challenging. Um, when we initially spoke, you said you didn't think you could speak for an hour, which you have just done. <laughs> yeah, I never do. I never do interviews. I think this is the second time I've ever been interviewed. So, you know, well done on keeping me here for an hour. <laughs> well, it, that was really, really very easy. <laughs> that was fast, Simon. Thank you so much. That was a re really interesting thank insight you. into the audio stuff. And just before we say goodbye, I just want to remind people I am going to be back next week. Uh, I'm going to be my guest next week is going to be Blair Bathory. Um, who's been on the show before? Uh, Blair Bathory does um, fear. I'm waving my hands around all over the place. Um, does Fear House, um, uh, a, a YouTube channel uh, which shows uh, short films um, and, and, and which she really supports independent filmmakers? I'm going to be talking about three of the films which have influenced her um over the years so i'm looking forward to doing that um so hopefully some of you can join me next week and uh yeah simon thank you very much indeed thank you it's been a pleasure good 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 um thank you for watching folks and as i say hopefully you'll be able to join me next week i'm going to hit the uh, in just stay safe in the meantime i'm going to hit the stop broadcast